Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk to Professor John Day. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Uh, for those who don't know, John has been teaching at Oxford University since 1980, where he is currently Emeritus Professor of Old Testament Studies. He has written or edited 17 books. The 18th is currently in progress. It's a, his commentary on the book of Genesis, chapters 1 to 11. And he's authored over 78 articles and over 200 book reviews. His earliest work centered mostly on the Canaanite background of the Old Testament. Uh, for example, there are uh, books on the dragon conflict, uh, Molech and child sacrifice, and Yahweh and the gods and goddesses of Canaan, as well as a prize-winning essay on the goddess Asherah, mispronounced that probably, and her relationship to Yahweh. But in the last decade or so, he has concentrated his research on Genesis chapters 1 to 11, the very beginning of the Bible. And this has so far resulted in two collections of essays, uh, from creation to Babel and from creation to Abraham, both spin-offs uh, from his research for the forthcoming ICC commentary on Genesis 1 to 11, which he says he tries to work on every day. <laughs> Um, now, the book of Genesis is one of the most widely read and influential books in history. Um, here is my very brief list of the famous stories we read about in Genesis chapters 1 to 11. The Bible, of course, begins with the famous story of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then we get the creation of Adam and Eve. And we read about the first sin and its punishment uh, resulting in Adam and Eve's expulsion from Eden. And then we have the story of Cain and Abel. Then we have Noah and the great flood and the covenant with Noah. And then we have the fascinating story of the Tower of Babel. And chapter 11 ends with a brief introductory mention of Abraham, who's actually not called Abraham then, but that's uh, how he's known today. So if I may just begin with a question, um, uh, Professor John Day, um, there are questions in the scholarly world about the authorship of this text and, and why scholars have discerned various literary traditions in Genesis 1 to 11. Now, the popular belief, of course, is that Moses wrote this book, in fact, all the first five books of the Pentateuch of the Jewish Bible. But scholars I understand, often point to uh, doublets and contradictions. For example, there are two creation stories in Genesis. If you read Genesis 1, 2, you'll see there are two stories. The flood story uh, uh, contains contradictory details. So what does this tell us about the authorship and dating of Genesis? Thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. Um You're right. The, the, uh, the first five books of the Bible were traditionally understood to be written by Moses. But when you look at them carefully, they don't actually always say they are. So if you look at Genesis 1 to 11, there's nothing in the text that says it was Moses. And um, it's true that all modern critical scholars um, would reject that view and, uh, and see a combination of sources that an editor has put together. Mm. And... The reason for this, as you somewhat intimated already, um, is that there are almost a, a vast number of things said within Genesis 1 to 11 are said twice. Mm. or And sometimes when they're said, they don't agree mm. always, the doublets. And sometimes you get different divine names. And one divine name will go with one thing and another divine name with another, specifically Yahweh, who, of course, Orthodox Jews don't pronounce the name, name but uh, Yahweh, the uh, um, distinctive name of the God of Israel, is found in some places. And Elohim, a more general word for God, is found in others. And interestingly, it's not like where a modern believer might say, oh, God, one minute, and oh, Lord, the next, and it doesn't mean they're two people. Uh, it, it's quite mm -hmm. clear that these differences in divine names go with other differences in theology and in style. So yeah. a very strong case can be made that they are different sources. Mm. Um, to point out some of the differences, in Genesis 1, traditionally thought to be from the priestly source, the, the six-day creation story, 
we read that man and woman are made together on the sixth day. Mm. Whereas when you come to the next chapter, chapter two to three, traditionally seen as the Yahweh's source, you see that um, the man is made first, um, so called Adam. Adam means man, of course. And, and before the woman is made, the vegetation is made for the mm. Garden of Eden. And whereas in Genesis 1, the vegetation was made before both the man and the woman. And woman is made uh, at the climax. Um, there's a joke about this. I could tell you a silly joke. Uh, oh, uh, one woman said that uh, when God made man, she was only testing. So, I mean, <laughs> So feminists would see that as, or some feminists might explain the woman being made last in that, yeah. in that sense, whereas others might think it's a bit secondary made last. Anyway, you could debate that. Anyway, uh, so differences with regard to creation. Or another thing, in the flood story, we seem to have two complete flood stories mm. that have been put together and a bit like a jigsaw. Yes. You know, they're really mixed up. And uh, many ordinary religious believers who read the flood story might not notice this, because I suppose if you approach the text assuming it's infallible, you're not looking for errors and contradictions, are you? You're no. hoping to be instructed by the text, not to uh, not to find uh, problems in it. But um, it isn't one of the features of, of that that flood story that in, in 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 some of the details it says you know Noah is to bring in the animals in two by two, yes. uh, and then another, and then just That's several right. verses later it becomes seven. That's right. Uh, and you're thinking, hang on, what was going on here? It doesn't make any sense. That's right. So. <laughs> That's right. It's when we actually try to read the biblical text seriously, and quite often those who most affirm their belief in the Bible are quite often those who don't read it or don't read it with attention. Um, like that, really. uh, or they read specific bits, their favourite bits of the New Testament, maybe. But it's true what you say. At the end of Genesis 6, where the divine name is Elohim, God, uh, Noah is told to bring the animals all in two by two. But the beginning of Genesis 7... Right afterwards, where the divine name is Yahweh, translated the Lord in our English Bibles, traditionally, it, it, um, Noah is told to bring in uh, seven of the clean animals and a pair of unclean animals. That means ritually, ritually clean and <clears throat> unclean. And, um, and it's difficult to see how both could be correct, because at the end of both uh, uh, those narratives. It said Noah did what God had commanded him, but he can't have done both, <laughs> can he? So, uh, um, so there's one problem. Uh, also, in the flood story, the length of the ark, the length of the flood differs. In one version, it lasts for a whole year and 10 days, mm. from the 17th day of the second month to the 27th day of the second month the next year. That's um, a year and 10 days with a lunar calendar, which might mean it's a solar, a solar year, quite likely. Uh, Whereas in the other source, it's all over in 40 days and 40 nights. And, uh, and then you have three weeks with the birds being sent out. So it's only yes. 61 days. So both those can't be right. And those who try to, uh, fundamentalists who might try to harmonize make them, harmonize them um, you know, it's a bit forced how it, you know, it doesn't really fit together. But if you separate the two stories, you, you can read two complete stories and they read beautifully without any confusions. Um, mm. So um, that's with regard to the ark. Some other points we can make is in Genesis 6, verse 3, uh, God limits man's life, humanity's life, to um, 120 years, yes. which is actually uh, about the uh, longest That's anyone right. has lived. Yeah. I think some French woman's now made it to 122, so she's now outlived she what God uh, said was the limit, but uh, as in modern times. But um, um, but when you read Genesis 11, the genealogies there, you see human beings are still living hundreds of years. Yeah, or quite as long as in Genesis. In one case, like, like well, in Genesis five, in Genesis five, it's up to a thousand. But in Genesis uh, uh, eleven, it's still it's several hundred. Now it's interesting. You mentioned thousands. Well, behind Genesis five, um, it's generally thought to lie the Sumerian king list. You have ten long-lived kings before the flood in some versions of the Sumerian king list, as in Barossus. Um, uh, and they live for thousands of years. So the figures in Genesis 5 are really quite modest. Anyway, my point is that in Genesis 11, they're still living several hundred years, yeah. um, which is more than 120 years. And, you know, how do we explain that? Well, it's quite simple. Genesis 11 uh, is from the priestly source. That's quite clear from the the style and the language when genesis 6 uh, verse, uh, verse 3 it's clearly from the uh, 
Yahweh's source, the name Yahweh is mentioned in that context. Um, um, or even, even in the table of the nations, Genesis 10, it's a list of the nations of the world as the Israelites knew the nations, you know, as far west as Spain, you might be interested to hear. Uh, Tarshish, that's top oh, Tarshish Tarshish in Spain. Spain. Oh, yeah, because the Phoenicians went there and got precious metals. That's how the Israelites knew about it. As far east as Elam, which means southwest Iran, ancient Persia. Yeah. As far north as Ukraine, which is called Ashkenaz. As far south as Yemen, that's called um, um, uh, Sheba, uh, and, and then the sea in East Africa. Now, um, I want to say that in Genesis 10, some, some of the nations are mentioned twice. Some mm. of them are mentioned twice over. Now, that seems a bit odd. And they're clearly the same nation. Assyria is mentioned twice. Havilah is mentioned twice. Sheba is mentioned twice. Um, and Lud for Lydia, that's mentioned twice. But it's interesting. Egypt is mentioned twice. Egypt's mentioned twice as well. Uh, no, not Egypt. Um, no. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw not you. In that chap, not in that chapter. Uh, that's right. <laughs> but... Um, it's interesting that they clearly come from two different sources because where you get these differences, one of them starts with the heading um, uh, A was the father of B, mm. that's the Yahweh, whereas the other says X, uh, the sons of X. So they've got a different way of introducing um, the genealogy. Um, um, uh, and, and so it fits beautifully the idea that even in Genesis 10, you have two sources. But, um, but perhaps I've said enough about differences and contradictions. Um, uh, you asked about date and authorship. Well, yeah. these works are commonly attributed to the Yahwist and the priestly source. Mm. Most sensible scholars would think J or the Yahweh source is earlier, but there are some crazy people who want to make it late after P, just as for some crazy people who want to put P before J, you know, I mean, oh. the standard view Sanity. has been J yeah. is earlier. And this is, can be supported on the basis of language. J has a classical Hebrew style, which fits the pre exilic period. Uh, I would date about 800 BC, but I know some people would now date it later, uh, but I have my reasons. Uh, and um, P, I think, is about the time of the exile. Some people think it's uh, post exilic. I used to think that myself. But in Genesis 10, uh, the table of the nations, Persia is nowhere mentioned by name. If yeah. this came from the Persian period, it's a bit odd not mentioning Persia. It uses the very old name Elam. Um, similarly, the name of the Chaldeans, Arpachshad, looks like a distorted version of Chaldea, Babylonia. And that makes sense if it's written when the Chaldean Empire was you know, in process, time of Nebuchadnezzar, say, the Babylonian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... On balance, I prefer to prefer to see that it's from the exilic period. Um, what about five, six, about five fifty, something like that. Five, yeah. six, something yeah. like that. That's P, um, and the language of P is later in many ways. Um, yeah. um, just to mention one example, it, it uses a knee for the in Hebrew for the word I, whereas J tends to prefer Arnoki, which is the earlier form. I mean, these things, these differences can be multiplied. Uh, so um, J has to be before P, I think. Um, I should say there are some people, some critical scholars who now reject the um, documentary hypothesis, this division into J and P. There are some, there are some Germanic scholars who, who now um, disagree with this in various ways. But I oh, think well, they're wrong. Get, 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 well, given what you said about doublets and the contradiction, yeah. oh, the, the way the language coheres with the... Oh, yes. Oh, they're not denying... Uh, 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 that it's composite. There are some scholars who would just see what we used to call J as an editor of P, an editor, you know, oh, rather than a, uh, rather than a separate original source. Just as there are some people who would see P as an editor of J. Now, I think that's totally wrong. It's in the flood story. You have two complete stories. You know, you know I don't think either can be editing the other. They're so long, and each right. account is long and and disagrees quite a bit. So, so just, I, just to clarify, no, no, these scholars are not rejecting the composite nature. That's right. And they're not going back to mosaic authorship. No, 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 no not at all. So th 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 this is a kind of an, an in-house discussion about, that's well, right. maybe this edited that one. But I shall mention that in case there are biblical scholars listening and <laughs> they might wonder why I haven't mentioned this. <laughs> uh, but I should say that the traditional view, therefore, is that it's a separate editor who's combined J and P together. Hmm. Now, you might well wonder... Why would an editor combine contradictory material? Doesn't that well, seem a bit odd? That's the Did question. Did he not know what he was doing? You know, uh, um, that's an interesting question. The most likely explanation is that the editor 
wanted to combine as much of his sources together as he could manage, oh. even if it didn't always show here. Maybe he didn't always notice the disagreements, or if he did, maybe he thought, well, God might know the answer, but I don't. He just want to bung as much together as possible to include as much material. So in the flood story, because you can't have two floods, you know, it's a, yeah. they're combined like a jigsaw, whereas in Genesis 1 to 3, you get one story after the other, mm -hmm. which is made possible because the Genesis 1 story is primarily about the creation of the world, and Genesis 2 to 3 is primarily about the creation of man and woman, but they each have a bit of the other, so there is a bit of overlapping. But, yeah. Um, right. So... Okay, no, that, that, that's clear. Um, thank you for that um, very thorough explanation. Perhaps my, my next question, if I may, um, is something I'm particularly uh, fascinated uh, okay. by. In, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we read the following. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So my question is, is about this plural let us used by used by God in Genesis 1 26. How is this to be understood? I mean, is, is it intended to be inclusive of other beings other than God, us? Or is it a kind of proto Trinitarianism, as many of the early fathers in the Christian yes. church said, look, we, we see here the beginnings of an understanding of God as uh, as a trinity. Um, what are your what are your thoughts on this as a Hebrew specialist? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, it is a question which is still debated, but the majority of modern critical scholars feel quite certain that God is addressing what we might call the angels, originally seen as gods, you know, the heavenly council right. around him. Um, um, we can reject the view that it's a royal plural because Hebrew doesn't have a royal plural. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can reject the view it's a plural of exhortation. One scholar thought, well, it's like you've got saying, oh, let's make man talking to himself, you know. Uh, <laughs> I know <that. laughs> um, there's no evidence for a plural of exhortation. As you say, uh, the church fathers, understandably in a way, they thought, aha, we have the Trinity here already in the Bible. And, um, and I think that view was common. Um, I think the reform reformers like Luther and Calvin, I think, would have taken that view and, um, and, and were still held by, you know, conservative Christians for centuries afterwards. And, and even today, I've often heard this. This is why I'm asking. Yes, of course. I, I often hear this, a missionary. Yeah. Well, I, I know I Karl Barth, you know, who wasn't a fundamentalist at all, a yeah. modern theologian, what's called neo-Orthodox. Yeah. Uh, a couple of generations ago, Karl Barth, well, he thought that it indicated a plurality in the God deity but he, he didn't want to quite say it was a trinity he thought that was a bit going a bit far because yeah, the trinity is a later christian concept but um 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 now one might object to this view uh, what, what kind of no one might object to this view by saying well these angels didn't part didn't participate in the creation the next verse said god did it you know mm. who's a singular being um I think what the situation is that God is addressing his courtiers and saying, you know, he's getting their kind of agreement to what they're going to do. And then, but then God actually does it. But, right. um, but um, uh, I would like to compare Genesis 3 verse 22, where um, after Adam has eaten from the forbidden tree, God says the man has become like one of us. Mm. He does say like one of us, not just like us. So it clearly implies that, a plurality, but that's the J source. But I think in P, it's something similar there. Um, uh, oh, in Genesis uh, 11, in the Tower of Babel story, God says, let us go down uh, to sit to see, you know, the work that the, the men are building the tower. And um, again, it's pr probably God and his heavenly counsel there. Again, you might want to say, well, what other evidence is there? There were angels around at the time of creation. Well, I would point to Job 38, verse 7, Oh. where it got a Bible, it, it says that um, all the sons of God shouted for joy at the time of the creation of the world. Now, yeah. sons of God is, a, as we all know, is a term for the angels, originally gods surrounding Yahweh. So at least you get the idea that the angels are around at the time of creation, even though it doesn't say in Job that God consulted them. You know, but, um, 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 but, but by the way, I, I would see it that, um, uh, that human beings are made in the image of the angels as well as God. Um, 
Oh, that was my, that was because, my question, because, because, because it, it let us make them in our image. So that's it, right. The so, hour is inclusive of the divine council. I that, think it has to be. But right. uh, I don't think there's a problem there, because if you look throughout the Bible, the angels are typically seen in human form. Um, right. Um, you know, Gabriel in the book of Daniel is described as one in the likeness of the sons of men. Mm. And probably the one like a son of man in Daniel 7, is probably Michael there, but it, it's um, most likely an angelic being. Or do you remember the beginning of Genesis um, 18, where three men come to see yeah. Abraham, the, the, and then they're called gods. Yeah. Uh, one minute you wonder what's happening here. First of all, they're men, then they're gods or angels. And, uh, um, you know, and, uh, early Christians naturally saw the Trinity there as well. Um, but in that passage, it certainly does indicate a certain plurality in the divine being, I think. Um, uh, sometimes the angel of the Lord in, in the book of Genesis and elsewhere is um, seen as an extension of the divine personality. Yes. You know, in the one minute, the angel of the Lord sounds like someone distinct from God, and the next minute, it is God. So yeah. one biblical scholar, Aubrey Johnson, suggested this could be a, a preparatory you know to the to the trinity in a sense you know, the idea of god having an extension of the personality so it's not quite such an alien to judaism as some jews might imagine the idea of an extension of the um personality but i've gone off genesis 1 to 11 there okay. i just wanted to share with you um some words from the uh, the esteemed the jewish study bible okay. uh, published by ox university press it's a uh, a very scholarly, critical work. Uh, um, yeah. And just on this very question, the verse, verse 126, uh, in a comment to this, uh, just a few references there. The plural construction, let us, most likely reflects a setting in the divine council. And then they reference 1 Kings 22, 19 to 22, Isaiah chapter 6 and Job chapters 1 to 2. And they continue, God the king announces the proposed course of action to his cabinet of subordinate deities, though he alone retains the power of decision. And what struck me about this uh, also, apart from the, the things we've already discussed, is that if this is accurate, then this is not monotheism. If there are subordinate deities, then it, 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 uh, unless there's a kind of honorific figure of speech to, that applying to angels, they're not really god in the absolute sense that yahweh is portrayed as but it, it, it's kind of pushing at the boundaries of monotheism isn't it a bit right well first of all i wanted to say i couldn't agree more with what you just read from the jewish study bible i could have written that myself even though i didn't <clears throat> that's just a standard scholarly view they're putting forward there yeah uh, with regard to the question of monotheism i would say it all depends whether you think these sons of god are angels or gods mm. because christians over many centuries and um other, other monotheists who may believe in angels, um, uh, I believe Muslims do, don't they? There's the angel Gabriel. That is not thought really? to compromise monotheism. Uh, well, it, it, and um, being, Jews so. as well, of course. Well, um, um, if they're simply angels, then they're on a lower level than God. They're heavenly beings. But right. if you think they're literally gods, which originally they would have been, um, then... That indicates uh, what we would call henotheism or monolatry rather than yes. absolute monotheism. Mm. You may remember in the Ten Commandments, God says, you shall have no other God before me, which is not quite the same as saying there aren't any other gods. It just says you're only allowed to worship Yahweh. Um, God of Israel. Right? Uh, yeah, God of Israel. yeah, but so I uh, um, originally these were gods. Interestingly, um, going off on a tangent, but a very important tangent. Um, in the Eucharistic text, the sons of El, the chief god who became equated with Yahweh, El, you know, Yahweh is often called El in later on in Genesis. Uh, El was a supreme god, a good chap, unlike Baal, you know, from those who like point of view, El, because he's a wise and creator figure. Um, he had 70 sons, the sons of El. We know wow. that we're told that they were 70 in number. And similarly, the sons of God in the Old Testament seem to be 70 in number. Because Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, says that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God. And we know they thought there were 70 nations. If you count up the nations in Genesis 10, for example, you will see there are 70. Uh, and in, later in 1 Enoch, they talked about the 70 angels of the nations, you know, when gods have become demoted to angels. So there's a Canaanite background here. And um, um, 
And I thought that would be interesting to mention. So Yahweh appropriated the divine counsel by being equated with El. Mm. By the way, um, that's why some Israelites gave Yahweh a wife, Asherah. Not, of course, the Old Testament itself uh, <laughs> abominates Asherah, but there were ancient Israelites, we know, who thought of Asherah as Yahweh's wife. And, and okay. that's because they'd equated Yahweh with El and taken over the wife too, and, um, yeah. which the Old Testament rejects, but they accepted the idea of the sons of God under him. Yeah. Perhaps that's enough on that subject, is it? No, that, that's, that's extremely interesting, uh, making that uh, <laughs> cross-cultural comparison. It helps to illuminate what's going on in, in, uh, yes. in the text. Very interesting. But my, my next question, if I may, is to do with the identity and the activity of the serpent in oh, yes. Genesis chapter 3, this snake that tempts Eve. Um now, is this serpent uh, 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 the devil? Like you see in John Milton's famous Paradise Lost, I really yes. recommend viewers, if you haven't read it, it's a marvellous bit of, almost a bit of sci-fi in a way, kind of pre-modern sci-fi. Um, is the serpent the devil in Genesis, or, or, or is the serpent to be understood in some other way? Yeah, well, I actually have actually read uh, um, uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost recently because... Uh, um, my commentary on Genesis 1 to 11 um, will actually be dealing with 2,500 years of a history of interpretation, Christian and Jewish and even Islamic, where it exists, uh, you might be surprised to hear. Uh, and so as a, in a, order to deal with this properly, I've been reading all this literature that I all didn't right. know so much about. So I have read Milton, very interesting um, work. It's now, it, 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 um, modern critical scholars would say that in, originally the serpent was not the devil, because the belief in the devil emerged later. Right. The word Satan first comes in the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, and that's about 300 BC, whereas most scholars will think of J, where that Genesis 3 comes from as several centuries earlier. Um, but the serpent and the devil did become equated, yes, and that became a w widely held view um, amongst Jews and Christians and also I know Muslims um, uh, because uh, um, uh, uh, I believe the Quran mentions the devil in this connection but doesn't mention the serpent but it is the case in some later Islamic writings they refer to the serpent. Now um, the first place where we find the serpent equated with the devil or Satan is in the book of wisdom mm. which is in the Apocrypha. Wisdom chapter 2 verse 24 and the book of wisdom it's generally thought to date from about the time of Christ. Mm. It's either very late BCE or very early CE, about the time of Jesus. Uh, that's the earliest equation of the serpent with, with the devil. And that view became widely held amongst Jews and Christians and I believe it was so. The Book of Wisdom is actually obviously written in Greek, so this, this is not yes. the, not the Hebrew text which we've been looking at in Genesis, but no. looking at a product of the the Greco-Roman Hellenistic world much much later, and, and maybe that's a I don't know that's a factor in it. I, I, yeah, um, well, Greek 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 thought influences the work a bit, but that's another matter. I think you know the, it, it integrates Judaism with with Platonic philosophy, so you get the four cardinal virtues of Plato's philosophy equated yeah. with wisdom, for example. Yeah. And he talks about immortality all the time, immortality yeah. of the soul, not resurrection not of the body. So it's very yeah. much, yes, uh, written in Alexandria, very likely, um, uh, uh, Hellenistic Jewish work. But I think the equation of the serpent with um, the devil, uh, is, I don't think that's anything to do with Hellenistic right. influence. Okay. Um, but, but this belief became widespread um, amongst Jews and Christians and is popularly imagined by, you know, yeah. people who hear about the story up to today. Um, yeah, yeah. Although some of them would say it was the devil was in the serpent rather than saying the serpent was absolutely identical to the devil. Yeah, because the odd thing is, I mean, the, the serpent in the story, if one just reads it from chapter one onwards, the serpent is directly created by God. You know, he, he, he is, you know, he is a creation of God. He's not like a twisted, yes. uh, malevolent being. He, this is God's creation. So he's, he's yes. being a bit naughty. He's being a bit wicked. He's, he's insinuating yes. that maybe what God says isn't quite right. right but, you know, yes. but never sees a creative being of God. So this is kind of a bit odd that, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the serpent has yeah. described as, uh, as the um, one, of, one of God's, the, um, more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. Had made. So he made yeah, it. Uh, so it's one of God's creatures. On the other hand, 
you can't say it's simply an ordinary snake because, for example, it talks and it has uh, supernatural knowledge, which I, I don't associate with ordinary serpents. So there's something a bit magical about it, yes. a bit uh, supernormal. It's Although later, you know, that when the, at the end of Genesis 3, the serpent gets demoted, you know, and, um, yes. and there's this constant conflict between um, human beings and the and, and, and serpents or snakes, you know. That, yes, you know, he's made to eat up, up, isn't he? He's no longer this, you know, he's made right. to so he's been doing, on you know, belly he, Humans treading on the head and, and the yeah. serpent and, and, and snakes biting the feet of human beings. That's mm -hmm. the point of Genesis um, 3, verse 15, where God says, he, that's a serpent, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That later God understood as a... Mm as a prediction of the battle between Christ and Satan, yeah. but that's yeah. reading into the text what isn't there. No, uh, and, and, and Mary, even Mary, the New Testament doesn't wrong. do that. That's later, uh, yeah. you know, fanciful okay. reading. But, well, um, but I, can I just say, I've got more to say about the serpent for you. Oh, what is the origin of the serpent then? Hmm. Various views have been put forward, um, which I've um, uh, criticised in my very late... Um, latest book from creation to abraham further studies in genesis 1 to 11 it just came well, out a few if you could hold it up a bit further sir, we, we can you see the top of it no we can't see the middle and the, the bottom of the book so if you could is that better? no if you there, just that, if you hold it up hold it up that's better from yeah. creation to abraham further study yeah sorry for this self-advertisement that not to confuse with my earlier book uh, <laughs> from grace to babel studies okay. in genesis you could, 1 to you hold it up again higher higher uh, sorry yeah, and a bit, a little bit more. Creation to Babel, John Day. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah oh, that's right. That, that, that picture on the front of. And, uh, anyway, one of the chapters uh, in the okay. later book is all about the serpent, and I, I discuss about six new views that have been put forward in the last decade. Believe it or not, really? uh, rejecting them all. I bet I won't recount <laughs> them all here. I don't want to bore you to death. Um, but the most likely view, I think, though one can't be certain, is that the figure of the serpent in Genesis three is probably a reworking of the serpent in the Babylonian Gilgamesh epic. Oh. Now, I don't know if you know about the, the Gilgamesh, people know about the Gilgamesh epic. It's a Babylonian epic um, in which Gilgamesh um, is overcome by the death of his friend Enkidu, mm. and it makes him want to search out eternal life. Uh, and he um, encounters Utnapishtim, the Babylonian flood hero, um, who, had, who had been made immortal by by uh, the gods after the flood in the Babylonian understanding. And, um, and, and, and Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh he's got to find the plant of life if he wants to be immortal. The plant he's got of life. To eat that, and that will make him immortal like the tree of life in I Genesis. Was say, that's exactly what we find in Genesis. Similar. Now, what happens is, um, cut a long story short, um, um, Gilgamesh actually finds the, the, the plant of life uh, uh, but unfortunately drops it in the water and a snake swallows it up. So the snake rejuvenates itself instead of Gilgamesh. So thereby there's a moral that immortality is a bit beyond human grasp. That's what the story was trying to say, uh, the Babylonian story. Now, you see, uh, in, in the Babylonian story, you've got a serpent that is in one way or another involved with depriving humanity of immortality. I know the stories are quite different. In one, it's the serpent eats up the uh, um uh, the the, uh, 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 the plant of life and uh, uh, but it, 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 in, in, in the other it's um, you know the, in Genesis the serpent tempts human beings and thereby they're deprived from being in paradise and have no don't have access to the tree of life so you get the idea of tree of life or plant of life a serpent and, and immortality all kind of bound up so even if I, even if Genesis isn't directly dependent on Gilgamesh epic, and that's possible. Um, I think they're, they're sharing some common ideas, a yeah, common world of thought. Similar motifs. So they're, 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 and uh, we know the that. Gilgamesh epic, a fragment of it has been found from Palestine dating from about 1200 BC at Megiddo, for example. And, uh, and of course, it has the flood story, which is quite like that in Genesis as well. But, um, um, but that's my view, but we can't be absolutely certain. Um, but clearly the serpent, whatever its origins, it it's the voice of temptation in mm. Genesis is three. It's sort of the voice of temptation you know, to not do what God wants them to do. I obviously see that in the, in the synoptic gospels without going into that issue, but where, where the, the, the devil uh, tempts 
uh, yeah. Jesus in the accounts in yeah. Matthew and Luke, although th- those two accounts are quite different in some of the details as well. So it's analogous to the devil, they're not actually yeah. the devil in the idea of the original author. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. That's extremely interesting. Thank you for that um, explanation. Right. Um, my next question is um, about the Tower of Babel, actually. It's a fascinating oh, yeah. uh, story. Um, very brief. <clears throat> One can read it in, in Genesis, of course. But my question is, having read it just again today, I'm still perplexed as to why God is so concerned by the building of the Tower of Babel, particularly if you're coming from a a much later, richer kind of theology of of who God is and his nature, perhaps. It might strike discordant note because the reasons God gives in in the Tower of Babel for frustrating the builders and and what he did with their language and so on. I don't quite get it. Could you explain a bit better than that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, the story of the Tower of Babel, or, or Babel, if any Americans are listening, that's how they say it. Um, <laughs> this um, story has also been much debated and discussed by scholars. <clears throat> um, I think what what upsets God and makes him a bit worried is mm-hmm. the fact that human beings have said um, in verse 4 of chapter 11, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Now, the heavens is where God is. So, right. it, you know, it looks like an encroachment on God's um, dwelling place. So it's a bit human beings getting too big for their boots. I think that's what's in the author's mind. I mean, it may seem a bit primitive to us because we no longer believe in a three-decker universe. We've got up there and held down there, you know. It's a, um, <laughs> um, 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 um I think that's it. It, it. They're thought of as getting a bit beyond themselves in wanting right. to encroach right. upon God's um, territory. They're, they're literally why. encroaching on his, so they're literally physically entering into his domain, yes. the realm of... Yeah, it's interesting, can I tell you, it's interesting that, although I think the story of the Tower of Babel that we have is a kind of a myth, it's an attempt to explain the multiplicity of languages. Yes. It also explains the origin of the name Babylon, or Barvel in Hebrew, Babel. Right. You know, it says... It was called Babel because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth. Now, there's a Hebrew pun there that most English people won't know it, detect. And in my commentary, I would translate it as, uh, therefore, it was called Babel because there the Lord made a babble of the language of all the earth. So that retains the Hebrew word play, which I, I try to do as much as possible. Um, and sometimes it's impossible to. <laughs> but uh, there it's quite simple to um, revise English Bible that does the same thing, though I thought yeah. of it myself before I read it in the Revised English Bible. <laughs> um, now, I want to say that there actually was, although the story we have is not historical, I think, it's an etiology. Genesis 1 to 11 is full of etiologies uh, explaining yeah. the origin of things. Um, yeah. um, but there actually was a tower at Babylon, um, a ziggurat. Oh, yeah. uh, this was a temple tower. Uh, we know it had seven stages, a bit like a step pyramid, but with seven Stage. Well, it, it, it's extant, isn't it? I mean, I was, I, I, you can see well, ziggurat, or maybe not the some original. Ziggurats are, but the one, the best preserved is the one at Ur. Mm. And tourists who are bold enough to go to Iraq, which is still a bit unsafe, uh, typically go to uh, Ur of the Kuldis, and you see them seeing the the ziggurat there, which you can yeah. see as a certain number of stages. So still a bit ruined. But there's only the base of the tower that was at Babylon is now preserved. Now it so happens this tower was constantly being built and falling into dilapidation or becoming destroyed. Um, and, and we actually have Babylonian accounts of it, and it, saying it was made of brick and bitumen. Now, brick was not a typical Israelite material for, for building works. I mean, uh, uh, they typically use stone, not brick. Mm. So uh, the writer points this out. This is a bit you know, strange for an, a, an Israelite or a Jew, you see. Um, but we know that the Tower uh, Babylon, it was called Etem and Anki, um, um, it, it, in one of the rebuildings by um, um, Nab, Nab, Nabonidus, that's in the 6th century BCE, not long after Nebuchadnezzar, in his account of the rebuilding, he mentions brick and bitumen, mm. exactly as in as Genesis in Gen- 11. So yeah. It, yeah. it does seem as if that the author had some knowledge of the tower that was there, in his own time, whenever that was, uh, although he's made his own story out of it. And I think this illustrates what I was wanting to say about Genesis 1 to 11 more generally, that we can 
though the stories aren't literally parables, it's perhaps helpful if one is a religious believer and at the same time try to accept the findings of modern scholarship, if you can, if you can kind of combine these things. Uh, one way is to read these stories as being parabolic in a way. Um, um, so that you know, the story of the Tower of Babel, it's about human hubris, trying to, mm. humans becoming too big for their boots. It illustrates the thesis of pride comes before a fall. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And so there actually was a Tower at Babylon, even though this story, of course, is talking about primeval times. Uh, yes. Um, um, but only the base of the tower is still preserved, unfortunately. Mm. Interesting. So. I think it was quarried a lot in antiquity, antiquity and so uh, yeah, to build other yeah, things as well. Which tends yeah. to happen sometimes. Yeah, indeed. Um, is that enough on the Tower of Babel? <laughs> oh, but that that's, that answers the, the, the question. I, I think uh, in terms of the, yeah. the, the genre of the writing, you've you've touched on that as an etiological story yeah. rather than obviously a a literal scientific or historical account. Yeah. I mean, that, that approach, by the way, is still popular in some circles, say United States, amongst Christians who. Who, who read uh, this primeval history, Genesis 1 to 11, as actual historical slash scientific fact, you know, the yeah. creation of the universe and these... Well, I, I, can, I can tell you that uh, uh, I must be about 65 years ago, I was, I'm now 73, about 65 years ago, I was at the local church that I attended was, was fundamentalist, uh, conservative evangelical, so I'm very familiar with this um, mm. kind of outlook, you know, we were told to believe the Bible is an infallible book without any errors and um, you know and you were kind of a bit of a heretic if you thought anything otherwise and that's what led me as I you know studied uh, to, to, uh, though I still see myself as a Christian I see myself as a more liberal Christian and um, try to combine modern knowledge with religious faith um, um, but I'm very familiar with um, the way you are fundamentalism is especially mm, mm. noteworthy in America you're quite right um, mm. I mean, British conservative evangelicals, well, they would typically say, oh, Genesis 1 to 3, we know that's not historical, but mm. one wonders how far they want to extend that not being historical. I mean, uh, <laughs> would they? Yes. Um, uh, and I know it can be difficult for some people, um, mm. but what one perhaps could bear in mind is, of course, that, you know, um, Jesus himself spoke in parables. These were stories he made up to illustrate religious truths and... Um, mm. You know, and think of great literature. Not everything in Shakespeare's plays is sort of absolutely historical, is it? But it's, uh, mm. um, you know, but people see great meaning in in such great works of literature. So, you know, I think God can speak to us through different genres and um, right. of material, and, and and history doesn't have to be the only one. But that perhaps it's, brings you on to your next yeah. But my next question is is just from a um, uh, penultimate question as well is. Yeah. The surface reading of Genesis um, 1 to 11, um, am I right in thinking in, in that, uh, 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 there may be a more critical answer, but am I right in thinking that human beings from Adam and Eve onwards were all vegetarians? Oh. They didn't eat meat. Because is, is it only reading in Genesis again, that only with God's covenant with Noah did God permit yeah. the eating of meat. Uh, and this is chapter nine of Genesis, although you can't eat all flesh. I mean, if it's got blood in it, you know, the life, yes. uh, then you're not allowed to do it. But it struck me looking through it, what, what, where, uh, you know, until that point, permission hasn't been given explicitly by God to eat meat. So um, yeah, uh, it's ex quite, quite extraordinary because it, it, you don't normally think of um, Adam and Eve as the proto vegetarians that uh, they're not so sort of symbols of the vegetarian movement in the world, <laughs> you know, be like Adam and Eve and just eat fr uh, fruit and veg. Perhaps and they should be. I'm uh, surprised no one's done it. Do you know what I mean? It's just an obvious yeah. thing to do. But anyway. Perhaps maybe some people don't read much of Genesis one beyond chapter one, verse 26, Molly, but if okay. you read it on it, it's God says quite clearly, I have, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. Mm. And, 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 um, there's nothing said about um, humans eating animals at that point. And you're quite right in Genesis 9, after the flood, which particularly seems to have been a judgment on human violence, violence between humans and animals and between animals and animals, it seems, um, um, as a concession to, to human nature, at the beginning of Genesis 9, God says, okay, you know, human <laughs> beings will now allow you to eat meat, but you mustn't eat the blood because the blood is sacred, the seat of the life. Yeah. Um, 
but also, you know, it says, you know, humans aren't allowed to murder humans. You know, it's all right to kill animals, but you're not supposed to be killing other human beings. Um, um, so there's a new beginning for humanity after the, the, the flood. Now, those two texts, Genesis 1 and the beginning of chapter 9, are from the priestly source. Right. And for the priestly source, there is no sacrifice till the time of Moses with the laws in Leviticus, chapters 1 to 7. Now, people probably don't read Leviticus all that much. Many people think it's rather boring, and I suppose I agree in a way, even though I'm an Old Testament scholar. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but okay, you know, okay. one can make it work is boring. <laughs> one can make it interesting, you know. Yeah. Once you get into the it's sacrifices. Very, yom, yom Kippur and all that, is, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, it is. Yes, absolutely. Leviticus 16, yes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so for the priestly source, there is no sacrifice no. till Leviticus, to the time of Moses. Now, for the J source, you have sacrifice from the beginning. In yeah. Genesis 4, there's a story of Cain and Abel. You know, um, Cain offers uh, the fruit of the earth, and um, but Abel offers, um, you know, an animal in sacrifice. Sacrifice. Um, and... And so it's quite likely, you know, that being offered in sacrifice, uh, that it, you know, you know, it would have been partly eaten. It would have been a peace offering. That was something shared between God and the human beings, unlike the burnt offerings that were wholly consumed on the altar. Uh, but we're not told that that's what it was in Genesis 4. So it's probably the type that would have been partially eaten. So um, in J, I think there is meeting, meat eating earlier uh, than the priestly source. It's yet another way in which uh, the sources don't quite cohere. Um, and in my uh, view, um, this explains why, if you know, the usual Hebrew expression for to make a covenant is to cut a covenant. Now, people who don't know Hebrew may not know this, but the usual expression is karat berit, which means to, to cut a covenant. And uh, why would you use cut a covenant as a term for making a covenant? It's quite obvious. It was because cutting up an animal in connection with making a covenant. You find the same terminology in Homer, sometimes quite explicitly, you know, uh, um, you get the same vocabulary. Um, um, uh, and so that explains why P doesn't talk about cutting a covenant, but establishing a covenant. If you read Genesis 9, God talks about establishing his covenant with Noah, not cutting a covenant. And I have argued, and most people who've heard my view think it is convincing. Um, um, my view is that this is because there is no sacrifice before Moses for P. So he has to use a verb that doesn't suggest sacrifice that the verb to cut would suggest. Uh, and so he f formulates a different terminology. He talks about establishing a covenant. And it's the same with the covenant, priestly covenant with Abraham in Genesis um, 17. It talks about establishing a covenant. Or right. giving a covenant, where Genesis 15, the, the earlier version of the um, covenant with Abraham, talks about um, ma ma um, you know, cutting a covenant. So, uh, so gone off the, your subject a bit, but it's, this is to explain that uh, I think there's a difference between J and P. But and, Adam, and they well, in Genesis 1, the human beings, there should be a model of uh, vegetarianism. And you may recall that... Um, uh, in places like Isaiah 11, do you remember verses 6 to 9? In the end days, the lion will lie, lie down with the, you know, uh, the lamb and, uh, and you, you get peace in harmony. Yeah. Um, this is projecting into the future the situation of paradise, you know, that uh, you have total peace in harmony. And, um, 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 because it, the last things correspond to the first things. That's one of the essential things right. in apocalyptic. That's why in the book of Revelation, you have a new heaven and a new earth, mirroring the first heaven and earth. Um, so, um, so you get this eschatologization where we get, um, you know, a return to, you know, to peace in nature. Um, I just imagine that some words, are, I don't mean pretentious, that T.S. Eliot's um, four quarters, in my beginning is my end, and in my end is my That's beginning. right, yes. There's returning to the beginning, yes. for, as if for the, as it goes on, as if for the first time as well. Yes. Get well this, I remember my doctoral supervisor saying that the, the lion will need a new set of teeth if this, if this is to be fulfilled. But um, on a humorous note, uh, I don't know if you've been to Jerusalem, but in Jerusalem, no, uh, I've been uh, half a dozen times, um, once spent a whole year of my life there, but uh, but um, there is something called the Biblical Zoo, one of the less well-known features really? uh, <laughs> of Jerusalem, uh, which I have visited twice, 
Uh, and in this biblical zoo, the Israelis, in a rather gimmicky way, have tried to fulfill Isaiah 11 before oh, the really? eschaton. So when I first went, you, were, you, you saw all these wild animals all, all living peacefully with the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the others. And, um, but they, didn't get, they couldn't manage a little child to lead them. That was a bit, <laughs> a bit dangerous to have children very, very wise, in very the zoo, wise. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but when I went a few years later, I noticed some of the animals had died out, or maybe they'd been eaten up. I don't know. But okay. anyway, that's the biblical zoo in Jerusalem. I would recommend it uh, yeah. to anyone who goes. They try to have you all the animals of the Bible there on show. I, I, one, of, one of the lessons from what you're saying is, is the, from the composite nature of the uh, of this text, which I think, you know, there the are quite compelling reasons to accept, yes. is that the Bible then speaks with a multiplicity of voices. It's yes. not a single voice. The voice of God yes. says X. You know, we have a multiplicity of voices saying different yes. and occasionally contradictory things, if one takes it yes. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very straightforward mm. way. And so my question, which was premised on a, a, a non-critical reading, you know, no, no, no one uh, eats meat until Noah, or no one can eat meat, is actually uh, rendered much more interesting by uh, by noticing these little these little details, like you, yes. you see the Cain and Abel story, um, which suggests, given the composite nature of the text, that we have different understandings of this within the same Bible. Yes, and, and this multiplicity of voices is, uh, uh, unless one's used to it, if one's a conservative Christian, is quite difficult to kind of deal with. I think. Yes, um, indeed. And, of course, also in the New Testament, you can find certain differences of emphasis. Um, mm. You know, Paul says we are saved by faith, not by works. And when you read the epistle of James, you know, you know, yeah. it, it said, you know well, well, faith is not enough. Faith is not Jesus, enough. You need works. Yeah. In Jesus' um, gospel, you have Jesus' but, judgment scene. You're judged but by I your think, God. you know, James either misunderstood Paul, because I think Paul means by faith, something different from James. James just took it to mean intellectual belief. Well, I think Paul thinks yes. of faith as being a total devotion to yes. God, like devotion to Allah in Islam. It's a total submission. Yes. Um, uh, and, you know, and Paul, of course, does accept uh, the need for works as a consequence of faith. But so either James misunderstood Paul or he, mis or he was correcting a misunderstanding of Paul, you know, however you want to put it. But I've gone off the subject of Genesis there, haven't I? But um, yeah, people can find this disturbing, but... Um, in a way, it's rather like in, the, in in modern religions. I mean, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam say they all have their disagreements. I mean, Muslims, you know, the, the Shiites and the and um, and the Sunnis. And um, I've been to Iran, believe it or not. So I've actually seen Shiite um, um, uh, Islam, and there are certain differences there within mm. Judaism. You have not only the Orthodox, but the Reformed and the people oh. called the conservative who are somewhat in between. And uh, in Christianity, you have many sects, you know, Catholic and Protestant and many divisions. And within many of the divisions in Christianity are within denominations, aren't they, of course, you know, Absolutely. between those who are more conservative and those who are more liberal. And um, mm. and so this um, disagreement and different views, it's a, it seems to be a feature of religions um, up mm. to the present day and seem to have been in antiquity, you know, in the first century there was... A, <laughs> disagreement should gentiles be let into the church you know yes. without being circumcised that was a big row over that you know yes. so um rows over women priests or more recently over homosexuality these seem to be um, a feature of what um uh, religions involve don't they um, mm -hmm. um um and also if you look at um, religions throughout history they are constant quite often trying to integrate the current philosophy of the time like the book of wisdom is integrating with um, yeah, platonism and aquinas is taking aristotelian philosophy into mind and uh, um and then you get the enlightenment with you know uh, christians and and jews um, um taking account of the enlightenment if i may say so i know you're quite interested in islam i in a way i feel that you know, muslims need to go through the enlightenment or some you know, I mean, I know some are, but they're usually more secular kind of Muslims I meet. You know, the real Orthodox. Uh, they still, well, certainly they, um, um, the people who support terrorism or would support assassinating um, 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 Salman Rushdie. I mean, obviously, they, they obviously haven't been through the Enlightenment. They, they need a, you know, to... <laughs> anyway, 
gone off the subject again. But okay. Uh, no, I, I, I just that's the last question. If we can um, just move to that, um, it, it, given what you said about the the, multi, the the composite nature of the text and yes. the multiplicity of voices uh, that one can see uh, all across the Bible, actually, as you say, this is a feature of the New mm-hmm. Testament uh, as well. But focusing on Genesis one to eleven, what importance do, do these chapters have for us today? Is it all oh. myth? Um, whatever oh. that means, and I know this is a contested term, and there are many definitions of it. But is it yeah. all myth, or can the text still speak to people today? And I don't mean just Jews, but I mean Christians and, yes. and Muslims. Can it speak meaningfully to us today? And if so, how can that be done? Do you think? Well, I want to argue. I would have my cake and eat it, and argue that both <laughs> are the case. That the stories are, in a sense, myth, but at the same time, can be meaningful for us today. Right. Now. With regard to the material not being absolutely historical, I just point out a few points that um, um, Genesis one, uh, the, 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 the Genesis one to eleven presupposes that the world is no more than six thousand years old. Right. Uh, now, only a few American fundamentalists, I think, would still want to maintain that. Conservative evangelicals in this country would, I imagine, not want to say the world was only six thousand years old. Yeah, or again, Genesis 1 speaks of the world being created in six days. God rests on the seventh. And also there's the account of a universal flood in Genesis 6 to 8. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, just over 4,000 years ago, if you take the biblical chronology strictly. Now, there's no scientific evidence of, of a flood, uh, between 3, 000, a universal flood between 3,000 and 2,000 BCE. So... These are just a few things that fly in the face of modern scientific knowledge. Mm. However, I want to add that there is no reason to doubt that the original stories were meant literally by those who wrote them. You Uh quite often find apologists today who will say, oh, it was never meant to be taken literally. Um, I think that is mistaken. I see no evidence for that. I mean, the evidence suggests that the writers meant what they said. Um, interesting you should say that at other points. I, I know one of your uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Professor James Barr, who was professor of oh, yes. uh, Old Testament, I think at Oxford. He was my think? colleague at many years ago. Oh, did you know? How amazing. Um, I mean, Absolutely. He, Great man. Yes. Uh, he, he's taught me a lot uh, over the years uh, through his work. But he made precisely the point that you're making in a celebrated uh, paper that he wrote, uh, yeah. that how people had, oh, well, we, we, we interpret these things literally. But the ancients didn't do that. They had a much more blah, 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 you know. And he said, no, 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 no. This is meant to, as you have, precisely as you have just said. So uh, it's interesting what well, I'm hearing it from you and from him. Yeah. Now. yeah. Well, that will be the general view of modern critical scholars. Um, um, of course, there are some things in the Bible which are metaphorical, but, you know, what can you just see that that's the case, you know, that uh, it's poetic or something. But uh, um, um, anyway, uh, so... I think we can't doubt the stories were meant literally originally, but but I think if we're honest, we can no longer uh, accept that. Yeah. Um, even though I've said I've said that there really was a Tower of Babel, even though you know, even though our story you know is not historical, there was a Tower of Babel. Just as I think there was a literal flood. That's something I could say more about. There was a little yeah. flood, I think, uh, but a mini flood. Um, yeah. Um, the original Babylonian flood hero was a king of Shurupak, and we know there was a localized flood there about 2900 BC. Uh, mm-hmm. You see, and that is probably the germ of our biblical flood account. It's been, right. it's been sort of universalized. Yeah. What was a local yeah. flood? Yeah. Uh, global, but yeah. I go to even some centuries ago, some Christians debated what was it a local flood or a universal one, and um, and there's a scholar called John Walton. If you've come across him, he's a He's a conservative evangelical, but he tried to have his cake and eat it. And, and so he, he says, well, it wasn't a universal flood. It's just hyperbolical language, you know. But it, but, um, the language um, is quite, quite literal. I mean, that language is very clear, repeatedly stressing the global nature of the... Yes, that's right. Yeah, it is yeah. intended as global. Anyway, um, there probably was some local flood that was at the origin of it. Mm. Uh, now, um, modern scholars will call the material in Genesis 1 to 11 myth. Now, to the man in the street or the person in the street, uh, myth usually means a load of rubbish or something <laughs> false. And we sometimes use the word in that sense, you know, like, you know, the idea uh, that Trump myth. won the 2020 yeah. uh, 
election is a myth, you know, even though he believes it. But um, um, I mean, uh, a controversial example, but for our that's right. Well, I don't they actually think he did. Controversial in America, not to most people in the world. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, 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 but, but there are some Christians want to define myth as, you know, stories involving gods. Because that means you can exclude everything in the Bible, or, or you can try and argue it's losing by which is basically monotheistic. Um, but I think that's too narrow addition just to say it's stories about gods. I think that's being a bit too far. But you're, you're absolutely right. There's no generally accepted definition of what myth is. But we all think we can see it, know it when we see it, but even though it's a bit different. I, I think it, in G.B. Caird, uh, another Old Testament scholar, I oh, think yeah. it was Cambridge, uh, in his book Language, Truth. Yeah. Um, I knew him as well. Uh, which, uh, yeah, which, which is uh, one of the most amazing books I've ever read on the Bible. I mean, he, he lists definitions of the word myth. I forget how many, but it's like 20 definitions of, of, of the term. You know, so, so when we use this word and toss it around, it, it of course, is very imprecise. Yes. So we, we may mean yeah. things by it. Yes, I knew Ked. He was on the committee which appointed me in 1980. So that was a long time oh, ago. Oh, wow. You knew him. You knew him. You know, he's a great guy. He's great scholar. Well, I've been around. It shows how ancient I'm getting. I'm 73, <laughs> 74 next month. Um, <laughs> anyway. But uh, I, I, anyway, I was just continue what I was saying. Um, uh, but having said all that, I still think it is possible to find some valuable meaning in some of the stories or some of the elements in the stories today, right. whether for Jews, Christians or Muslims. Um, for example, Genesis 3, the story of the temptation of Adam and Eve and the story of the serpent and the expulsion of paradise, I mean, modern critical believers would, would see that as a myth. I mean, it's a bit difficult reconciling it with the evolutionary development of humanity, really. The idea there was a literal historical fall at some point in the past, it's a bit difficult to fit in, really. Um, but nevertheless, when you read the story, when you think about it, it's, it's absolutely true psychologically. You know, the way the man blames the woman, yeah. the woman blames the serpent, nobody taking responsibility for their actions. That's yeah. just like true human nature, isn't it? Yeah. You just think about politicians. They never want to make <laughs> made a mistake, do they? <laughs> um, um, so, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the Tower of Babel, it wonderfully illustrates the theme of pride come before a fall. You know, the idea of human beings getting, trying to usurp the position of God and um, mm -hmm. getting too big for their boots and, um, and coming a cropper. Or also genetic. This is 126, the verse you alluded to earlier, mm. human beings made in the image of God. You may know that Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that marvellous man who died just a few months ago in his fight against apartheid and racism in South Africa, he was, if you read his books, he was constantly talking about humans being made in the image of God. Uh, men and women, people of all races, were all in the image of God, which means that every person is worthy of a certain respect. Mm. Uh, they have a certain dignity. Mm. which was being denied to them when they were being, you know, you know, enslaved by the apartheid government. So he was very keen on this passage. Um, and something else that's very relevant, I think, to the modern environmental crisis that I've already alluded to, after Genesis 126, human beings are told to have lordship over the world. Mm. Now, there was, a, there was a American scholar a generation ago called Lynn White who who argued that the whole of the modern environmental crisis can be blamed on Genesis 1 because human beings were exploiting the world. Yes. He under, misunderstood what it meant by yes. having dominion over the earth. And it's quite clear that that's not what it means, because as we've just said, human beings are uh, a vegetarian at this point. No animals are being killed. Yeah. And it's lordship over the animals, which is specifically mentioned. Mm. So that must mean that it's being meant in a benign sense, what we would call stewardship, I suppose. Right. Um, no, it doesn't use that word, but that's what it means. Just as the Hebrew Bible, you find in various places, the king is spoken of as a shepherd, um, which means, you know, you know, having kindly looking after the animals. So um, that is under God. Human beings are seen as his, you know, vicegerents, having authority over the earth uh, and are meant to treat it kindly. Now, this is very relevant, I would think, in our modern environmental crisis, even though Genesis 1, of course, didn't know about that. But, uh, you know, we can apply the, the idea there that we're meant to, you know, look after the world that we're in. Uh, and we're seeing this more and more, how important this is, isn't it? I mean, the way we're going, the, hum the world's going to become too hot for us to, um, 
uh, tolerate and uh, mm. and, and the um, uh, danger of ice, um, you know, the ice melting at the Arctic and Antarctic. And, and so perhaps this brings a certain meaningfulness of the flood story to us, even though, of course, in um, the flood story, well, again, wasn't thinking of global warming. I mean, the, the flood is a punishment for human sin, especially violence. But we could see that, you know, how human actions today could could lead to, um, you know, disasters such as we read in the flood story. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I think there's an environmental message. And I also wanted would want to say that um, um, in the New Testament, and I believe in the Quran, um, for example, there's no real detailed account of the creation of the world. Creation is taken for granted. So, but here you actually have an account or two accounts, <clears throat> Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So it's good that we have something about creation there, that God is the creator of the world and not just its redeemer, but also its creator. So I think that's very relevant because the New Testament Quran just takes all this for granted, doesn't it? And, um, it, it does mention in several places God's creating uh, uh, creation of the world. In, yeah, that's right. It's alluded to. That's right. That's what I mean by taking for granted. It's, yeah. it's alluded to. I mean, that's a true. You don't get a detailed account is what I mean. No. Um, um, okay. I don't know whether, I know you're very interested in Islam and, um, and have a great knowledge of it far more than I do. But uh, as I, I have been dealing with the history of interpretation, of Genesis 1 to 11, and I did notice a few interesting things about Islam. There's a bonus point here for an extra, I wasn't expecting that. So if you. No, I know, I, uh, but, I, but I have been, uh, you know, I've been learning a lot by right. dealing with 2,500 years of history interpretation, learning a lot about things I knew nothing about before. But I could mm -hmm. just mention a few interesting things uh, specific to Islam. Um, um, one is that. Um, you will recall that repeatedly when we hear about Adam in the Quran, um, um, you get the story about how the angels were told to bow down to Adam and that they all did except Iblis, the devil. Iblis, a big word from Greek diabolos, meaning the devil. Um, and I was always wondering why on earth would God want angels to bow down to Adam? Seems an odd thing to do. It sounds a bit idolatrous to me, but I... But then I realized that, um, that, that this story actually was taken up by Muhammad from, um, from earlier Christian tradition. It's found in a work called The Life of Adam and Eve uh, from about the first or second century CE, where you get the identical story told that uh, Satan refused to bow down to Adam. And as a result, he gets, you know, cast down from heaven. He's no longer one of the angels in heaven. Ain't Satan has fallen. And... And it's quite clear that the reason that they're supposed to bow down to Adam is because Adam is made in the image of God. Genesis 1, I know it's a different story, Genesis 1, not Genesis 2, but they read it all as a unity. Uh, Adam made in the image of God, and so he's got something godlike about him, and that's why the angels are supposed to bow down to him. Uh, that explained that thing in the Quran, which I always wondered, why on earth you do that? Something else I've discovered is that you may recall that in Genesis, Noah doesn't say a word until Genesis 9, until the last, after the flood. He doesn't say a word. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Quran, um, uh, Adam is, uh, sorry, Noah. Noah is constantly um, warning the people to repent and, you know, so they don't become a victim of the flood. Mm -hmm. And now it so happens this too is found in earlier Jewish and Christian tradition. It's found in the first century in the 2 Peter 2 verse 5, now it is called a preacher of repentance. It's there over half a millennium before Muhammad. So modern Korean scholars, people who examine the Quran critically, just as I read the, um, the Bible critically, would see that Muhammad didn't just get it from the angel Gabriel, as an Orthodox Muslim would maintain, but, but it was some tradition he took over. And sometimes when he took over traditions, he didn't always get them quite accurate. For example, um, 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 yeah, there's a place I discovered myself that in uh, um, that Noah is said to be 950 years old when the flood came. The Quran mentions this. I don't know if you recall mm. the place. Mm. Whereas in Genesis, which is much earlier, uh, it's Noah lived to a 950 years altogether. 
not just 950 years when the <clears throat> came. So one has to assume that sort of perhaps these traditions came over an oral tradition. That's how Muhammad got them. Uh, that's what modern scholars would tend to think. And so he didn't get it quite right there. And it would be far-fetched to say the Quran is right and Genesis is wrong. With, you know, the sense think, of Genesis, we I know from you know, ancient manuscripts, is, you know, is many centuries older than the Quran. So there's some interesting things I've come upon. I, I do want to add that I have read the Quran and find it in many ways an inspiring book. It's stark monotheism. And, uh, but as with the Bible, I think one can be inspired by the reading of a religious work without always accepting it's 100% infallible. Yeah, and just on that point, it's interesting, <clears throat> the recent work by Professor Nikolai Sinai, who's a professor at Oxford as well, uh, mm -hmm. he's a scholar of Islam, or more particularly the scholar of the Quran, and he's not a Muslim, but uh, he, he talks about the way, uh, if I've answered him correctly, the uh, the author of the Quran, as, as he calls him, um, um, critically interacts it's called inter, inter, uh, w w between uh, w with the previous books the, the the new testament and the and the and yeah. the jewish bible so it's not necessarily the case that when uh the quran differs from the bible when it's talking about the same stories that the, the quran has got it wrong so to speak um that there may well be um a, a different view when it comes to prof the prophets or uh, other yeah. other details you see there's some details uh, of the birth uh, 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 of of Jesus and the life of Mary in the Quran, if you compare that with the yes. story in Luke, for example, in the Timothy narrative in Luke, so the stories don't always match. But uh, I think Professor Nicholas Sinai would 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 stress, uh, as do many critical scholars these days, it's not like in the Oriental days of old, but when there's a difference between the Bible and the Quran. Oh well, the Quran's got it wrong, but the, the Quran um, sees itself in, in having a sometimes a corrective, uh, sometimes a different way of of telling similar stories. Um, based on its own understanding of of God and what happened in history, so um, it's not necessarily a mistake. It's sometimes one, different reasons. One might wish to call it a corrective. Alternatively, one could accept that that because I know there are a number of places where the Quran seems to be following Jewish midrashic tradition, which grew up after the Bible. It was sometimes simply mm. accepting later Jewish, you know, interpretations of the biblical text which weren't in the Bible and. Um, um, that can sometimes be the case, um, I, I would want to say. But I say in, this is one of many ways in which my work on the commentary, I've learned so much, uh, you know, not only about Islam, but about Judaism and you know, about Luther and Calvin. I've been reading all their works on Genesis 1 to 11. It's, um, yeah, um, so Adam Calvin wrote a huge amount. Uh, yeah, Calvin was more scholarly, but perhaps more boring, more scholarly. Uh, whereas Luther, Luther often went off the point. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we'll keep taking pot shots at the Pope, you know, which wasn't quite strictly relevant <laughs> to the biblical exegesis, you know. <laughs> you, didn't like, you didn't like the Antichrist, I mean the Pope uh, at all. Oh, no, absolutely, uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been reading the Church Fathers, about whom I historically haven't done very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know very much. And um, and and Second Temple Ju Judaism. I, so, I, so in a way, by writing this commentary and dealing with history of interpretation, I'm really dealing with the whole of theology, you might say. I mean, dealing with yes. Genesis and, you know, the controversies between science and religion, and which became very, you know, marked in the 19th century and continue to the present day. Uh, so, but as a writing a commentary, by dealing with this history of interpretation in a way that I don't actually have to do, but doing it because I thought it would make my commentary more interesting. I think it is. It'll make, it make it much more interesting. Well, you I, will. Uh, I thought, yeah. you know, I'm getting into all these subjects. Uh, now, I must tell you that most people who've written for the ICC commentary, it's, that stands for International Critical Commentary. And it's probably the most thorough and detailed commentary series in the world. That's why it's taken me so long to write. Yeah. I think most of the people who were asked to write commentaries didn't live to finish them. Okay. Uh, and so um, at the age of 73, I'm very much hoping I will live. I'm in good health. I hope I will finish. I'm sure you will, God willing. Yeah, I, I mean, yes. Um, but... Um, Part of the problem is uh, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking to write an ICC commentary, and I'm only dealing with 11 chapters. Mm. Uh, just think if you had to write 60 on all 50 chapters that John Skinner did on Genesis for the ICC. He did it all in six years, he said, when he was the head of a theological college at Cambridge. And you know, I, I haven't finished, I've, I mean, I've spent more than six years, and I haven't finished Genesis 1 to 11 yet. Um, um, so it's the most thorough series, and many people were deputed to... Um, write for it, didn't live, because partly I think some of them never got started, frankly. Some yeah. of them never got started. And some of them left it too late. 
Mm. It's quite a good thing to do in retirement in a way if you've got good health because you don't have to worry about government research uh, um, uh, assessment exercises. You know, everything has to be done in a seven-year period. If you haven't yeah. got a book in seven years, you're, you're thought to be no good. You know, and you, you know, actually, you know, a professor at Edinburgh got sacked because he hadn't written a book in a seven-year period, although he'd written many books previously. Right. That. Um, um, so... Um, uh, I'm hoping to get it finished in my lifetime. That's why I only agree to write on Genesis 1 to 11, not the whole of Genesis. I thought that Very wise was. decision. Very, uh, you, you need to live as long as Abraham, apparently, uh, not Abraham, Adam did, or... or uh, oh, well, I won't make or, that. Or no, actually. I just want to mention, there's a friend of mine called Ron Hendler. I don't know if you've heard of him. He has, he has been writing the, uh, the um, Anchor Bible commentary. That's another oh, yeah. biblical commentary series, yeah. like the IC series. An American friend of mine at Berkeley, California. He is over. He was over thirty years late in <laughs> submitting his commentary on to what? the editor. He submitted it just a few months ago to John oh, Collins, uh, a famous uh, um, scholar. You interviewed. Oh yeah, I've, I've interviewed. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, okay. Good friend. Uh, uh, sorry, what, what was the yeah. book on? What was the commentary on? That was thirty years late. Oh, Genesis one to eleven, the Anchor Bible. Oh, I commentary. see. It was oh, due God. to be submitted in night. Submitted in nineteen ninety, <laughs> not started, but and he's only just finished it over thirty years later. But the editor had uh, patience uh, and waited for it because they knew he was doing it, you know. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, I hope I won't take that long. And um, I'm hoping it will be finished in the coming years. And uh, Inshallah. Um, well, I, I do very much look forward to seeing it. It's, it's, it's a monumental work of scholarship, as you say, made much more interesting by these cro cross cultural yes. uh, Abrahamic references that you you, you have undertaken. Yes. It makes it particularly interesting, and dare I say, more relevant to our contemporary world. Rather, yes, than, I think so. Uh, yes. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yes, although for the ICC series, we're supposed not to be confessional, so I, I'm not supposed to be preaching sermons or putting forward um, a particular religious point of view. You know, to say. Right. It's a critical yeah. work, obviously, by definition, yeah. the inter international... Yeah, that's critical. the nature of the series, really. Um, yeah, exactly, the ICC. Um, yeah. So it means anyone of any faith or no faith, they can read this commentary and, and realise yeah. that, you know, the writer, was, it, the writer, namely me, is trying to be objective, even though I know postmodernists say none of us is really totally objective. I still think we should make the effort, you know? Absolutely. So it's, not, it's not an excuse for giving up the attempt to be objective, even if none of us is actually totally objective. Mm. Anyway. Excellent. Well, that, that's a fantastic Thank work. So I do look forward to seeing it uh, one day when uh, it comes years, out. Yeah. Um, and so um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor John Day, for your time, your expertise, your generosity in explaining uh, your views and, and uh, alluding to your work. Um, so just thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you it. very much, Paul. It's been a great pleasure. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Till next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye.